venerable members of the Sangha, distinguished guests, beloved community participating in the live stream. We welcome you to May We Gather, a national Buddhist pilgrimage for Asian American ancestors. We extend our deepest gratitude to everyone who has gathered here today, in person and virtually, at the El Campanile Theater in Antioch, California. Many of us join together for the 2021 May We Gather National Buddhist Ceremony at Higashi Honganji in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles. We are honored to have another opportunity to be in community with you all, this time in Northern California. Today, March 16th, 2024, marks exactly three years since eight people, six of them women of Asian descent, were killed in a mass shooting in Georgia. In many Buddhist traditions, this third year memorial, like the one year, 100th day, and 49th day after death, is an important moment of transition for both the deceased and the bereaved. We gather this year not at a Buddhist temple that was vandalized, but at the site of a former 19th century Chinatown, marked in red on the map above, that was burned to the ground in 1876. The El Campanile Theater is situated in the immediate vicinity of this historic Chinese community, which we will be processing through in our outdoor walking pilgrimage following this ceremony. We are here because the scapegoating of six Chinese women that incited the burning of Antioch's Chinatown highlights a parallel to the six women of Asian descent who were blamed and killed in the Atlanta area spa shootings. This shared connection between these two incidents emphasizes the ongoing legacy of anti-Asian and gender-based violence. It also underscores a context of Christian dominance that has shaped the development of America's racial karma, and particularly the stereotyping of Asian immigrants as foreign heathens. Reporting on the burning of the Chinatown, a May 2nd, 1876 notice in the Sacramento Bee noted, quote, Antioch has now no Chinese or Chinatown. The Caucasian torch lighted the way of the heathen out of the wilderness. Though some Chinese residents returned, they faced ongoing religious bigotry and racial animus, leading to the eventual loss of the community, including its temples. In the case of Atlanta, the shooter was motivated by his fundamentalist beliefs of religious purity and saw the Asian women as, quote, temptations to be, quote, eliminated. We gather here in Antioch as an act of resilience, recovery, and repair. Just as the broader community restored the Higashi Honganji Temple and the Sangha came together to heal in 2021, so too do we unite together in Antioch. In May of 2021, the city, led by Mayor Lamar Hernandez Thorpe, was the first to issue a formal apology for the burning of its Chinatown. We join here today on this third year memorial as Asian American Buddhists, supported by friends of different racial and religious backgrounds to heal and repair the past and present racial suffering of Asian Americans and of other communities in Antioch, Atlanta, and across the United States. Gathered under the protection of this statue of Guan Yin, the all-seeing, all-hearing bodhisattva of mercy, central to the religious lives of many early Chinese immigrants, we build our resilience as a Sangha and cultivate fierce compassion and spiritual friendship. 
Our memorial brings together American Buddhist leaders from Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Khmer, Korean, Lao, Sri Lankan, Taiwanese, Thai, Tibetan, and Vietnamese Buddhist traditions from the San Francisco Bay Area and around the nation. We also want to recognize the Theravada bhikkhunis, Burmese monastics, and other Buddhist leaders who wished to join us but are serving their own temple communities this afternoon. In today's ceremony, we will chant sacred texts, transfer merit to Asian American Buddhist ancestors, and pray for the peace and protection of all beings. Six honored speakers will share Dharma messages on compassion, spiritual kinship, interconnection, transforming suffering, collective healing, and the path to enlightenment. We will also hear a prayer for caste equity. We will now chant an homage to the Buddha and the three refuges in the Theravada Buddhist liturgical language of Pali using a call and response style. The chanting will be led by Venerable Prat Kru Mana Siriratana Tamawite, Venerable Prat Maha Sai Chon Santikaro, and Venerable Prat Kru Baidika Jongrak Kemacharo of Wat Mankon Ratanaram in Berkeley, California. After we take refuge in the triple gem of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, Reverend Duncan Ryukin Williams of Zen Shuji Soto Mission in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, will deliver the Hyobyakumon, a pronouncement before the Guanyin statue about the intention of today's gathering. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sampu tassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sampu tassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sampu Putang saranang gachami Putang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sankang saranang gachami Putiyam pe putang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi bhutang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi tamang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi tamang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi sangkang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi sanghang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi putang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi putang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi tamang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami 
ติยาปิสังขังสารนาพระชาเมตตยาปิสังขังสารนางะชามิงโยบยาคุมง pronouncement of intention ชิกุสิเกงชิจูมุเฮนสิเกนดบุนโนมุจินสิเกนดงโอมม無料性願学仏道は無常性願上 The four bodhisattva vows beings innumerable yet vow to save all delusions inexhaustible yet vow to overcome all Dharma gates countless, yet vow to go through them all. Buddha way unsurpassable, yet vow to attain it. Today, on the third year anniversary of the Atlanta shootings, we recite the four bodhisattva vows as we reverently come before all Buddhas, bodhisattvas, and ancestors. We stand in the presence of Guan Yin. The Bodhisattva of Compassion, to conduct a memorial ceremony and a walking pilgrimage to heal those who have suffered due to racial and religious animus and violence. The Chinese characters of the Bodhisattva's name, Guan Yin, to see and to hear, reminds us to look deeply into ourselves and to listen closely. To the cries of suffering that emanate from any part of our interlinked world, sometimes we are the ones who need to be seen and heard, who need to be healed by compassion, and sometimes we are the ones who need to do the seeing and hearing. But either way, to transform suffering into liberation. Requires the many hands of Guan Yin, and today, we, the Sangha of the United States of America, activate the many hands of the Bodhisattva of Compassion to alleviate the suffering of those who've gone before us, and to repair the racial karma of our nation, because only together, with our many hands holding varied tools, can we transform suffering. Into liberation, beings innumerable, yet vow to save all. Delusions inexhaustible, yet vow to overcome all. Dharma gates countless, yet vow to go through all. Buddha way unsurpassable, yet vow to attain it. Shijo muhen se gando. บนนอมุจินสิกันดังโอมมมุริโอสิกันกักบุตรดอมุจโอสิกันโย May we gather.
Thank you, Reverend Williams. Arizika Razek of the East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland, California, will now share a Dharma message on loving kindness and compassionate action. Greetings, beloved kinfolk. I'd like to begin with words from the Karanaya Metta Sutta, the Buddha's discourse on loving kindness. And before I begin, I just want to invite you to look again at the altar there and at the images, to turn and to just look at your neighbor in appreciation of the beautiful two-armed form that we are. The discourse says, Think of every living thing without exception, the weak, the strong, from the smallest to the largest, whether you can see them or not, living nearby or far away, living beings living now or yet to arise. May all beings become happy in their heart of hearts. May no one deceive or look down on anyone anywhere for any reason, whether through feeling angry or through reacting to someone else, may no one want another to suffer. As strongly as a mother, perhaps risking her life for her child, her only child, develop an unlimited heart for all beings. In this place, colonially named Antioch, California, our indigenous Miwok relatives made covenants with the sentient beings around them. This land was sacred, as were their non-human relatives, the tule plants, willows and oak trees, the geese, deer, elk, and coyotes, the trout and salmon, the wandering stars, and the spirits of the mountains, the rivers and streams. In the spirit of generosity and loving kindness, and in accord with the second precept of not taking what is not given, let us begin by affirming the Chupkan, Volvan, and Julpin Muiwak, the original inhabitants of these lands. Let us recognize that the systemic injustices that displace, dispossessed, and attempted to annihilate them also displaced and dispossessed the non-human nations that they honored and served. On this day, as we commemorate our beloved dead, let us first acknowledge all the sentient beings that lived on these lands. Let's affirm the rights of the Miwok to their lands, their languages, their life ways. Let's affirm the rights of our other than human kin to life and place and security. I invite you to place a hand over your chest or belly and take a breath with me. Breathe in the air that was here when the Miwok gathered. Breathe in the air that was here, recycled time and time again when the land and the people lived in balance and harmony. And let's take another breath. Let's honor all our indigenous relatives, for we all come from peoples who revered the earth and acknowledged spirit. We are all descendants of indigenous peoples who respected women, who honored our queer, two-spirit, and gender-diverse kin. We are the descendants of those who supported the ill, the disabled, and the elderly, and who time out of time made kin of the stranger. I stand before you today as an African-American woman who is not only a descendant of those enslaved and brought here against their will, 
but as the daughter of an undocumented immigrant who came here seeking a better life. I am someone who was given sheltered and other mothered by Euro-Americans, Japanese Americans, and Jewish American peoples. Like many of your ancestors, my ancestors crossed the waters to arrive in this place. We share the grief of those who were separated from their homelands and kin. We share the legacy of not being able to be seen as fully human, of being denied the right to life, the right to benefit from the fruits of our labor, and to be educated in a way that honors the diversity of our bodies, our hearts, our spirits, and our intellects. As people of the global majority in diaspora in the United States, we carry the resilience of our ancestors who persevered despite lynchings, incarcerations, and attempted cultural erasure and genocide. In San Francisco, almost 80 years before the landmark Brown versus the Board of Education decision which outlawed segregation, Mary Tape sued the city of San Francisco so that Chinese American children could attend unsegregated public schools. African Americans were lynched throughout the South and North, and Chinese Americans were also lynched in California and across the nation. The sundown laws of Antioch which mandated that on pain of death, beatings, or worse, that no person of color could live in this land, in this town. They applied to African Americans, and only one black man, Thomas Gaines, is documented as living here between 1860s and the 1940s. In the 1870s, Idaho, was almost one-third Chinese before anti-Asian violence drove the Chinese from the state. Greed, hatred, and delusion led to the destruction of Antioch's Chinatown and to the destruction of Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma's Black Wall Street. These three poisons initiated the land theft relocation and death of Native Americans in boarding schools and missions, supported the relocation, property theft, and incarcerations of Japanese Americans. They enable the sundown laws all across the nation that mandated that African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and Latinx people were legally barred from towns, cities, and even states after dark. This is the legacy of these United States. Brothers, sisters, beings of all genders, take a breath and feel the earth beneath your feet. Again, I invite you to place a hand over your heart and feel your connection to the heart of compassion. Feel your connection to all those who have suffered at the hands of racial injustice. Remember the eternal law. In this world, hatred never ends through hatred, but by love alone is ended. And in the face of past, present, and future injustices, let us commit and recommit to the work of healing, peacemaking, loving kindness, and nonviolence. Let us honor and memorialize the unjustly taken lives of our kin by embodying their love, resilience, activism, and faith. As the anti-war, civil rights, and Asian American activist Yuri Kochiyama says, life is not what you alone make of it. Life is the input of everyone who touched your life and every experience that entered it. 
we are all, each one of us, part of one another. Living or dead, born or yet to be born, we stand in the presence of our ancestors and of each other. Let us consider living our lives, at least in part, according to the vow of Shantideva, an 8th century Indian Buddhist monk. May I become at all times, both now and for forever, a protector of those without protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with oceans to cross, <coughs> a bridge for those with rivers to cross. May I be a lamp for those without light, a place of refuge for those without shelter, a servant to all in need. For as long as space endures, as long as living beings remain, may I too abuck to dispel the misery of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Arizika. Venerable Dr. Long Yun Shi of American Bodhisi Buddhist Association in Santa Clara, California, will now share a Dharma message on spiritual kinship and peace. Dear Dharma friends, on the third anniversary memory of the Atalanta spa shooting, we are still deeply saddened by the tragic ethic of violence that were commit in the absence of noble right concentration, which is a source of peace and wisdom in Buddhism. The tragic brought a tremendous fear, anger, and bewilderment to our society. Why do these violence acts continue? The Buddhist teachings in the Agulimala Sutra can best answer these questions. Agulimala, a bandit who was devoted to killing and slaying, showing no mercy to living beings. He tried to murder the Buddha and could not catch up with him even when the Buddha was walking at a normal pace. When Agulimala mercilessly told the Buddha to stop, the Buddha responded, I have stopped. I have a case of violence toward all living beings. Angulimala, you stop. The Buddha is saying that the mind persists by hatred in the cause of a harmful deed. When people stop hating, the tragics will stop. In the Mahatarisaka Sutra, the Buddha gives clear guidance on how to cultivate our mind to prevent violence. The Buddha taught that any singleness of mind equipped with these seven factors, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effect, and right mindfulness is called noble right concentration. The mind with right concentration is a mind with the four boundless hearts of love, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. In this mass shooting, the gang men act with unskillful mind. He attempts to eliminate temptation by charging spas, as reported in his confession. The Buddha teaches us in the Dhammapata, hatred doesn't cease by hatred, but only by love. 
This is, interna this is internal rules. In these charges, the violence of hatred not only takes eight innocent life, but also destroys the families of the victim's loved ones. Furthermore, we pray for the victim and want to blame the gunmen for these violence actions. We also feel the pain and have compassion for their loved ones. Survivors of mass shooting experience traumatic grief. It's hard to come to terms with death that is sudden, unexpected, violent, and senseless. My heart acts for these families. I recall an experience I had providing support to a survivor of another track mass shooting that happened not long ago. Right after leading the memory services, I visited a survivor, one of the victim family members in the ICU of a local hospital. The next day, the patient asked to watch the live news of the gathering from the day before. After only 20 seconds of watching, he could not help but turn his head away and close his eyes. He was so re-traumatized that for days he could not speak. It was painful for me to see his suffering. Buddhists believe there is a spiritual kinship among all living beings. Spiritually, we are all related, free from the separation of our physical bodies. All discrepancies of race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, and social economic status disappeared. This spiritual connection is unconditional since we all have the Buddha nature, our true nature of an awakened mind. If we generously understand and embody our spiritual kinship through the right concentration and the boundless heart, we would care for all people as we care for ourselves and our families. There would be no hatred, no greed, and no killing. Instead, our love for all of our spiritual kin would compare us to raise them up and fulfill their needs without hesitation of their central thoughts. So let us practice the Buddha's teachings to cultivate our mind and strengthen our spiritual kinship. I invite you to join me in prayer here in the presence of the light of the Bodhisattva of compassion. This light represents our grief, the sorrow of pain of losing the eight friends we love and cherish. We pray for this season of grief to be as gentle as possible to their family members, friends, colleagues, and community members. This light represents our courage, the strength to treat others with compassion no matter what happened. The Chinese three character primary mentions human beings at their birth are naturally good. We pray for everyone to repent, to remain awakened to their natural goodness, to be free from anger and hatred, to know that we are part of an international vibe of life, and to let us encourage and embrace our unwanness in love and care. This light represents hope, a hope that the kindle for my skillful mind. Let us hope that as we make our way through our grief and practice noble concentration, we will discover inner courage and take comfort in our memories. We know that once found, hope can never be lost and will continue to grow as we share it 
with one another. Each one of us has the power to change our world, within and without. Let the work for be the change that we seek. Let each step of our peace work bring love and harmony to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Dr. Long Ying Su. On the altar before us are four memorial tablets bearing the names of Yong E Yu, Wicha Ratna Pakdi, Wang Yik Oi, and Sia Ban Ning. These four individuals are just some of the many Asian American Buddhists killed in acts of violence from the 19th century to the present. Because the history of systemic anti-Asian violence in the United States includes erasure, many of the names of those killed have not been documented. We say the names of these four individuals while acknowledging and honoring the many other names not on the altar today. Grief and loss connect us across different ethnic and religious communities. They also connect us in compassion and spiritual friendship. The fifth central tablet commemorates all people who have lost their lives through racial and religious animus. Venerable Dr. Long Ying Su will now lead us in a memorial ceremony. She will begin by chanting an homage to Shakyamuni Buddha, followed by the Heart Sutra in Chinese. During this time, Sasana Yi will be presenting the tablet for her grandmother, Wang Yik Oi, who passed away in 2020 to the altar. Venerable Dr. Long Ying Su will then recite the names on the memorial tablets and dedicate the merits of our practice to the deceased. Nigel, 
四界，不可寂灭，大无之一无的，一无色的，故菩提萨埵。一波热波罗蜜多故，心无挂碍，无挂碍故，不要空，不远离颠倒梦想，究竟涅盘三世诸佛。一波热波罗蜜多故，得阿耨多罗三藐三菩提。不知般若波罗蜜多，是大神咒，是大明咒，是无上咒，是无等等咒，能除一切苦，真是不虚。不说般若波罗蜜多咒，尽说咒也揭谛揭谛。波罗揭谛，波罗僧揭谛，菩提萨。Also, for all people who have lost their life due to religion and the religious animals. Ji Sutamwantani of the Bay Area Thai Sangha will now share a Dharma message on the sublime attitudes that enable us to transform suffering into positive change. It is such a privilege to be here today. Grab Namaskar, Namaste, Sawadi ka, Hello. How lucky we all are to be born as a human being. I want to start by acknowledging this. It is a privilege. For you and me, for it is not 
for every soul to be born a human and to develop the quality of one's own mind, to have the ability to purify one's own heart, to cultivate a boundless heart, to have sublime attitudes. As an immigrant, a woman, and an anti-violence advocate, I have seen, heard, lived, and experienced violence, anti-immigrant, anti-Asian, and anti-women biases, ill will, and unwholesome actions and attitudes directed toward me, people who look like me and sound like me. These experiences became a precious and valuable tool to serve marginalized people and to work with women who have experienced violence from a structure of society that is dominated by men. The violence against women and Asians that happened to young AU and my peer sisters, brothers that happened in Atlanta, Georgia and the tragic death of Thai grandpa Visha Ratanapakdi made me feel angry, hurt, and sad. I see the unjust society around me. It is absolutely okay to feel those feelings, acknowledge them, and use them to do something that is useful, helpful, creative, kind, positive, and not destructive to self and others. How do we go on as a society when violence happens? How do I go on working with survivors of violence when hatred seems to be all around us? How do we do this? When there are so many biases and tie who I am, how I look, how I speak, how I gender identify, I remember being born as a human is a privilege. We have the ability to understand, accept, and have sublime attitudes to create positive changes. We have the ability to live with those feelings consciously and not cling to hatred and anger. We let go and fill our hearts with mindfulness that comes from practice. I return to this teaching that my family in Thailand practices and to the boundless heart of the Brahma Vihara Sutta, which is the sublime attitudes. Many people are familiar with the four sublime attitudes. These are the qualities of the heart. Metta, loving kindness, or my tree, friendliness. Karuna, compassion. Buddhita, empathetic joy. Ubeka, equanimity. Metta, it is hard to imagine how we can spread loving kindness to those who cause harm and believe, the, believe that the racism, 
discrimination are rooted in delusion, greed, anger that exists within individuals. Some individuals internalize those biases from society, from various institutions such as media, politics, extremist groups, and consumer capitalism, or even a system of education that fails to create peace-loving people. We can seize delusion with delusion. We can erase delusion with loving kindness. Karuna, compassion. When we see someone hurt, injured, abused, or oppressed, we want them to feel safe, to heal, to feel better. We want to help them be free from suffering. Mudita, empathetic joy. It is sincere happiness in response to the success, safety, and happiness of others. Upeka, equanimity. The heart practice. It is the state of being mentally calm and collected, particularly in the times of difficulty, in times of political turmoil, war, hate speech, anti AAPI, violence. I don't accept these realities. But when I practice upeka, I have an equanimous mind. It yields peace and happiness. I stay calm, collected, and move forward. This allows me to continue working with people suffering from suffering. Uh, uh, sorry, with people suffering without being burned out. I work with immigrant women, survivor of domestic violence and human trafficking. They were abused by patriarchal system, many layers of oppression, biases, and a violent society. We are here today to remember and honor them and remember their strength, their courage, resilience, self-determination, and sacrifice. Like my mother said, how lucky we all are to be born as a human being Life is a blessing. Make the most out of it. Life is not what you start with, but how you make it end. For now, I am going to invite you to join me in a brief meta chanting. For those of you who might be curious about this Pali word, metta. Metta is a Pali word meaning loving kindness. Metta chanting is the radiation of loving kindness toward all beings. The chanting, the long version, is soothing, uplifting, joyful, and a great healing for the world pervading it with waves of love. But today, I am going to chant a much shorter version. Sape Sata Sukhita Hontu 
May all living beings be happy. Sape Sata Apaya Pachahuntu. May all beings be free from oppression. Sape Sata Avera Huntu. May all living beings be free from animosity. Sape Sata Anika Huntu. May all living beings be free from trouble. Sape Sata Sukhi Atanang Pariha Rantu. May all living beings look after themselves with ease. Thank you for listening with loving kindness. Thank you, G. Reverend Lian Shut of Access to Zen in San Francisco, California, will now share a Dharma message on interconnection and wholeness. This message will be followed by a prayer for caste equity by Temori Sundarajan of Equity Labs in Oakland, California. Dear friends of the Dharma, please take a moment to greet the people around you. Kind of like the seventh inning stretch. Now please take a moment to reflect on how you feel in your body, heart, and mind. What was mirrored back to you when you said hello to the spiritual friends around you? In what ways do you feel connected to them? In the Avatamsaka Sutra, there's an image of Indra's net. Our universe is depicted as strands crisscrossing. At the nodes where the strands cross, there are jewels. As the nature of jewels is reflective, they mirror each other. This depiction of Indra's net is a classic teaching about interconnectedness. This teaching can be misused to tell those of us in oppressed, downpowered positions to just polish ourselves so that we will shine like those in uppowered positions. This can foster the sense that accountability is solely an individual responsibility. I would like to bring in another view of this image. Instead of focusing primarily on the jewels, we can refocus our observation onto what holds all of us accountable to the net itself. So much of Buddhist practice is to shift to skillful view. We need to refocus to valuing the integrity of the net. The oneness of the Dharma is the health of the whole net. With such a view, we naturally realize that accountability is both individual and collective. Our practice is to value the integrity of the net and therefore to become willing stewards attending to the health of the entire net. Social justice 
is restoration that's based on realizing and stewarding the wholeness of our collective net. To remember the connections between us is what's equally important. These connections are individual, collective, historical, and systemic. If there are places in the net in which there has been devaluing, restoration needs to be made. Restoration can come in many forms, such as repair, rediverted resources, reconciliation, and reparation. The organizers of the May We Gather event that was held on May 4th, 2021, 49 days after the Atlanta spa shooting, are an example of stewards of the net, offering a model to restore the full value of the lives of the six Asian American women and others who have lost their lives due to racial and religious violence. Today, the organizers of May We Gather have chosen this location in which we are gathered, the El Campanile Theater in Antioch, California, to offer all of us a chance to come together as steward of the net also. For over 145 years, Antioch, like many cities in the United States, on a surface level, showed no signs of having had a thriving Chinese community. Evidence of the minimization and erasure of people of Asian ancestry has been seen, or excuse me, can be seen under the very ground on which we now gather. According to certain accounts, due to the sundown law that forbade them from being in public after sunset, Antioch Chinese residents built a series of tunnels to get from one point to another. These tunnels may have been used to travel to and from home, to jobs such as feeding, washing, and cleaning after non-Chinese town folks. Then, in 1876, violence erupted as the white residents of Antioch drove out the Chinese population and burned Chinatown to the ground. A plaza was built above. When Mayor Hernandez Thorpe was told about this history, he became aware of the broken, torn part of the net and supported measures for restoration. Today, the organizers of this year's May We Gather have brought us together to uplift both personal and structural social justice restoration as exemplified by Mayor Hernandez Thorpe and Antioch City Council. In May of 2021, as a response to yet another alarming rise in anti-Asian violence in their town, they did more than just stand by Asian Americans. They apologized for these past injustices and voted to establish a plaque and mural in the plaza, along with a permanent exhibit in Antioch's historical museum, celebrating Asian American contributions to the city's vitality. I am grateful to be here to celebrate with the May We Gather Committee and Antioch's leaders their skillful stewardship. And after today, how can we all act as stewards of the net? in whatever section of the universe each of us inhabit and travel. To see and attend to the whole net of Indra, we can ask ourselves, how are the strands made up? What are the conditions that led to this disparity in resources? Where have we allowed the net to fray or be torn? 
causing gaps? How have we been historically conditioned to not take care of that part of the net and thus don't nourish the jewels in that section of our world? Liberation is co-created. Will you join me? in recentering our view to the whole net. In doing so, becoming stewards of the net of Indra, committed to restoring and co-creating the net in equitable and sustainable ways. When the net is whole, we are whole. Living in a wholeness which supports all our well-beings. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Thank you for your presence and attention. Jay Beam, to those online and to here, all of our beloved community, it is my sacred responsibility and honor to read this prayer for caste equity. I do so holding the prayer book of my grandmother, my ancestor who I bring into this space, as well as Dr. Ambedkar, who helped to convert millions of caste oppressed people like myself to escape the terror of caste, which is also here in the United States. Please join me in this prayer as we bring in the many who have been wounded by caste. With a reverence for life, we express deep gratitude for the profound gift of Dhamma and Dhamma's grace. That which enriches our lives and our Sanghas, bringing us to wholeness. Yet within our sacred lineages lies the wound of caste from slavery to mass violence, economic exclusion and erasure, millions over centuries have endured this cruel system. The Buddha in his profound wisdom sought to dismantle caste, recognizing suffering as the very ground from which Buddhism arose, aiming to liberate all beings. With loving kindness, we extend our hearts to all who have borne the weight of caste. In solidarity, we stand together to heal, uplift, alleviate pain, and commit to our collective freedom. We also aim to end all suffering from all systems of exclusion, such as settler colonialism, white supremacy, racism, and caste. We pledge ourselves individually and as a community to understand the roots of these inequities and to transform suffering into compassion, understanding, and active love. With right thought and right action, we pave the way towards non-discrimination and love's embrace transforming suffering for ourselves, others, and all beings' grace in our journey to heal ourselves and the world. J. Beam. Thank you, Reverend Lian and Temori. Soon to be on the altar before us is a Kintsugi Lotus that was handcrafted for the 2021 May We Gather Memorial by James Okumura and gilded by Sangha leaders during that 49th day ceremony. Kintsugi is the Japanese art of repairing broken ceramics by mending the fractures with golden lacquer. 
in addition to symbolizing our potential for spiritual awakening, this lotus represents the transformation of our brokenness into beauty and suffering into collective healing. Venerable Hyungjung and Venerable Hyokun of Borisa Zen Center in Las Vegas, Nevada will now present the Kintsugi Lotus as an offering before the Bodhisattva Guan Yin. The offering of the Kintsugi Lotus will be accompanied by a chant in praise of the Bodhisattva of Compassion led by Venerable Thich Dinh Nye of Dian Dum Buddhist Temple in Peoria, Illinois, and accompanied by Evelyn Dung of Kim Guang Temple in Sacramento, California, Din Li, Helena Nguyen, and Conan Fan of Phuc Lam Monastery in Sacramento, and Tan Nguyen of Tian Guang Temple in Midway City, California. The Bodhisattva of Compassion is believed to hear the cries of those who are suffering and to come to their aid. After an opening chant, Venerable Thich Dinh Nye invites us all to join her in reciting the Bodhisattva's name together in order to generate the energy of great compassion and healing for each individual, our country, and our world. Đầu cần hiếm liêu bước cam lò Một giọt mười phương tới cột đầy Bao nhiêu trần lì tiêu tan hết Đang tràn thân tình ở ngay đây Nam mô Bồ Tát Quan Thế Âm. Nam mô Bồ Tát Quan Thế Âm. Nam mô Bồ Tát Quan Thế Âm. Nam Nam mô Bồ Tát 
Reverend Gray Song of the One Institute of Graduate Studies in Warminster, Pennsylvania, will now share a Dharma message on compassion and collective healing. It's an honor to be here today, united in a journey that calls for patience, great loving kindness, and great compassion, and an unwavering commitment to justice. Our gathering echoes a profound connection rooted in past lives and destined to continue in future ones. My roots are anchored in a lineage of Korean women caregivers, seekers of spiritual truth, and artists. Their lives woven with both hardships and triumphs have left an indelible mark across generations. These women defied societal norms, showing me that a woman's place and aspirations should not be quelled by external expectations. But despite having inspiring figures in my life, I've battled feelings of not belonging measuring myself against unattainable standards. I faced moments where fear and deep-seated biases silenced my voice. But today marks a significant change. I stand here embracing a new mindset. My body, intertwined with universal principles in every cell, is transforming into a vessel for exploration, transformation, creativity, and liberation. The teachings of One Buddhism have been instrumental in this transformation, emphasizing the essential role of women in our communities and highlighting the deep spiritual connections that unite everyone. Throughout history, women have been pillars of strength, wisdom, and compassion. In One Buddhism, they've often been the unsung heroes, fostering community growth and connection. And today, I want to spotlight Venerable Yi Chong Chun, a trailblazing female disciple who lived during the formative years of One Buddhism. Venerable Yi Chong Chun, emerging from a background of poverty, initially followed the path of a courtesan, a kiseng. However, a profound moment of realization led her to yearn for something deeper in life, steering her towards spirituality. Her journey to One Buddhism was met with initial resistance as her previous life as a courtesan was viewed with disfavor. However, the founding master of One Buddhism, Sotesan, said, the great intent of the Buddha Dharma is always to deliver all sentient beings everywhere in the spirit of great loving kindness and great compassion. In the world, there may be both high and low occupations, but in the Buddha nature, there are no such distinctions. And if you do not understand this fundamental principle, then you are the people who are difficult to deliver. 
So Tissa knew the great contributions a woman, woman would make in the Sangha and wanted to uplift their voices and contributions, recognizing their vital role in collective healing and growth. Venerable Yi Chung Chun made a significant impact as a principal financial supporter of One Buddhism in its initial years. She advocated for gender equality among orda ordained clergy and established her own temple in Jeonju, a legacy that still stands today. Therefore, the robes I don today mean a lot to me as they carry the memories and sacrifices of the courageous ordained women before me. These women fiercely fought for equity, believed in their boundless potential, and remained steadfast under scrutiny. This circle on my pomnak reminds me that it is time to strengthen the ties of kinship that bind us together, transcending the boundaries of race, religion, and gender. Our pilgrimage is as much about looking back and remembering as it is about looking forward and envisioning a future where diversity is celebrated, quality is a reality for all. In coming together to honor our losses, we also affirm our collective commitment to stand against the forces of hatred and bigotry. Our gathering is an act of solidarity, a declaration that we will not let the voices of those we lost be silenced. It is a pledge to carry on their legacy by working towards a society where such acts of violence are unthinkable. And so we gather. In the words of Master Sotisan, the great loving kindness and great compassion of the Buddha radiates more warmth and brightness than the sun. Thus, where this loving kindness and compassion reach, the ignorant minds of sentient beings melt away into the mind of wisdom. Their minds of cruelty melt away into the mind of loving kindness and compassion. The mind of miserliness and greed melts away into the mind of generous charity. And the discriminative mind of the four signs melts away into the all-encompassing mind. Therefore, the awesome power and radiant brightness of this loving kindness and compassion are incomparable. Our gathering today is a promise to reconvene time and again in a union of hearts and minds that endures across the ages, creating a legacy of compassion and unity for generations to come. Let us gather not just in grief, but in hope and in the belief that through our collective efforts, we can forge a path of healing, unity, and lasting peace. We gather today, and we will gather again. Kamsamnida. Thank you, Reverend Song. Sujata Balaga of the Gyoto Foundation in Richmond, California, will now share a Dharma message on the path to enlightenment. Om Namo Lokeshwaraya Om Namo Lokeshwaraya Om Namo Lokeshwaraya Avalokiteshwara, please shine your infinite compassion on all who suffer. Please bless us as we remember the specific sufferings of anti-Asian animus, 
religious bigotry, and gender violence. Walk with us as we honor the first steps taken by the city of Antioch to acknowledge past harms, and as we co-create a future in which such harms never recur. Please remain with us for countless eons, reminding us that you are a mirror for our own enlightened selves. Help us to overcome, through wisdom and compassion, the hardships, the violence, the insults, the injustices we will face as we continue to strive for collective liberation. Please remain unwavering as a lamp on our path as we ourselves become lamps on the path. There was a time when chanting and praying like this out loud in public would have been unthinkable to me. As a teenager, I believed keeping my prayers to myself was part of the teaching. Mantra is not performance. Better to keep my practice quiet, secret, hidden. And while there's some truth, to, some truth there, it was also an early expression of my learning that to be a good Asian in America was to be small, grateful, hands folded, head bowed. <clears throat> and it was my way of protecting myself from the consequences of being weird. In my small town <clears throat> in rural Pennsylvanian Appalachia in the 1970s and 80s, I was the only child of color and only non-Christian in my elementary school. Being called the N-word, having classmates make slanty eyes and ching-chong ching -chong noises at me was a near weekly occurrence. I was so often shoved from behind onto the rough macadam at recess, bloodied hands and knees, that Amma stopped buying me stockings. In high school, the racist violence morphed into gaslighting. When I called it out, I was told the real reason the high school death metal band wrote a song titled, Go Back to India, was because I drew too much attention to myself. Teachers and classmates alike advised me that my refusal to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior was the real reason I didn't fit in. I knew it would be less weird to be Christian, so each time I visited a church, I, I toyed with joining the others on the dais when the pastor called the uninitiated to a life in Christ. But it was the great Bodhisattva Jesus who stopped me. One sunny afternoon in 10th grade, as I lay in my backyard staring up at the cumulus clouds floating above our home, I wept and asked the Jesus rays for guidance. Jesus answered me. There is no safety here, he said. Jesus reminded me that his faith never made him safe in this world. In the end, he made the very same sacrifice as had so many other bodhisattvas and so many others to come. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The Vietnamese monks in the 1960s and the Tibetans today who become human torches, who self-immolated to shine an unthinkable light on the plight of their peoples and the countless protectors across Asia and the world who put their small children in boats, seeking safer shores. Considering Jesus's words, I went back into my house and sat at my family altar. I looked up at the Buddha. His serene face told me he couldn't guarantee me worldly safety either but he could teach me peace. Peace within myself, no matter what sufferings samsara would inevitably serve up. And there would be many. There was already the sexual abuse I'd been enduring in my home. 
And there would be a football player my first year in college who, after trapping me in a room at a fraternity party, commented on my race throughout his drunken sexual assault. And there was the suffering that lived in my DNA of my ancestors who fled the taking of their lands by the Portuguese and the pain of visiting as a tourist cathedrals built where my family temples used to stand. There would be glass ceilings no matter my accomplishments and quotidian insults that left me feeling forever foreign. And there would be years of contorting all that suffering into my own fault, drinking the poison of self-hatred so the things happening to me could make some twisted sort of sense. I know I'm not alone in these stories. Many of you have your own versions and histories entwined with those we commemorate today. How do we continue in the face of all that we and others suffer? For me, it has been the dharma time and again that pulled me back from the abyss. In 1996, when I first stood in His Holiness the Dalai Lama's temple in Dharamshala, with the most stunning and perfect Avalokiteshwara deity towering over me, I got my first taste that the image, with its almond-shaped eyes and bridgeless nose, and 11 heads and a thousand arms, was a mirror of my future self. I felt encouraged to stay the course, to walk the Eightfold Path to the other side of suffering. Avalokiteshvara, in that deity's androgynous perfection, took up a special place in my heart, reframing the words different and weird. Broken into a thousand pieces out of great compassion, reassembled into whatever form would be of greatest benefit to the largest number of suffering beings. An 11-headed, thousand-armed lamp on the path for everyone. No exceptions. You may choose now to close your eyes and look to Avalokiteshvara within as a mirror to your Buddha nature. As we look inward, let us ask, how bright will we shine as we ourselves become lamps on the path to enlightenment? And what form might that light uniquely take in our current versions of our beautifully evolving selves? Is your light a disco ball? A solitary candle guarded by a small hand in the wind, or an array of 108 yak butter lamps? Is it a clay divli, divali, uh, divli burning ghee, or a tian den paper lantern heading skyward? As we walk together today, let's see one another as lamps on our paths. I am so grateful to walk today, my journey illuminated by each of you. May we breathe and dedicate the merits of our witnessing, our sharing, our shining as we walk to the great enlightenment. Thank you, Sujata. Before our closing chant for today's ceremony, we would like to give some instruction for in-person participants about the Guanyin flower offering and our outdoor walking pilgrimage. During the chant, ushers will assist the audience in coming forward to the stage to make a flower offering. Please stay in line to proceed out to the lobby and then outdoors for the commencement of our walking procession. 
Venerable Kamai Sanyakuman of Wat Lao Sai Seta of in Santa Rosa, California, will now offer a closing blessing chant from the Lao Buddhist tradition. May these blessings reach all of you here in this room as we continue this pilgrimage outside, as well as everyone who has joined us via the live stream. We thank you all for your presence and participation. May the merit from today's gathering be dedicated to peace and healing for all beings. My name is Kamma. I come from what Lao Tse Si Tha. I come, I will uh, hit late. <coughs> มาเมื่อเนี่ยเป็นวันดีรำในธรรมพุทธบาลโอ้โหอยากที่นอนเข้าในได้ลังมามีสัตตาเกิดกาได้มาห่วงกันผู้สนเป็นมุ่งคุ้นควรเจอให้เจอจำเอาไว้สัตตาเอาทำกายยิ่งสายหน่อยใหญ่พระจังไหลรำเข้
seeking forgiveness, and committing to rectification of past misdeeds. This historic apology was first issued here at Waldi Plaza by Mayor Lamar Thorpe in May 2021. Thank you for having me. You know, just wanted to let you know that the council unanimous, unanimously agreed on this proclamation for the apology. I mean, this was atrocities that happened here, right here in Antioch, and we really wanted to acknowledge, one, that it happened, and two, that we wanted to, to present an apology, that some, hopefully something like this never happens again. So the resolution of the City Council of the City of Antioch apologizing to Chinese immigrants and their descendants for acts of fundamental injustice seeking forgiveness and committing to rectification of past misdeeds. Whereas on January 24th, 1848, gold was discovered in Alta, California, Mexico. And by 1849, people were coming to the region from all over the world to look for gold. Whereas the gold rush caused a huge increase in population by uh, migrants from the Eastern United States and other parts of the world, including China. Whereas between 1849 and 1853, about 24,000 young Chinese men immigrated to Alta, California, Mexico, which in 1850 became United States of California, well, United States, this being California. And by 1870, there were an estimated 63,000 Chinese in the United States, 77% of whom resided in California. Many, whereas many Chinese immigrants were met with racism, scapegoating, an anti-Chinese sentiment also known as xenophobia, which was at its highest between 1850 and 1870. Whereas Antioch in its early years was not exempt from xenophobia. Whereas this period of, in Antioch's history, like most of, you, most of America, is now known as the driving out, which forced removals of Chinese immigrants. Whereas during the driving out period, Antioch officially became a sundown town when it banned Chinese residents from walking city streets after sunset. Whereas in order to get from their jobs to their homes each evening, these Chinese residents built a series of tunnels connecting business districts to where the streets met at the waterfront. Whereas in 1876, Chinese residents were told by white mobs that they had until 3 p.m. to leave Antioch, no exceptions. Whereas, the, whereas after Chinese residents were forced out, Chinatown was burnt to the ground and Antioch made headline news. The Caucasian torch, which uh, wrote the Sacramento Bee, lighted the way of the Don't heathen see. out of the wilderness, and the actions of the citizens of this place will without doubt meet with the hearty approval of every man, woman, and child on the Pacific coast, wrote the San Francisco Chronicle. Whereas Antioch's early period helped negatively contribute to the nation's xenophobic disclosure, which led to legal discrimination in the public, which the establishment of the Chinese right. Exclusion Act. Whereas the system of the driving out and the visceral racism against persons of Chinese descent upon which it depended became entrenched in the cities, the state, and the nation's social fabric. Whereas the story of Chinese immigrants and the dehumanizing atrocities committed against them should not, should not be purged for, from or minimized in the telling of Antioch's history. Whereas the city of Antioch must acknowledge that the legacy of early Chinese immigrants and xenophobia are part of our collective consciousness that helps contribute to the current anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander hate. Whereas a genuine apology and seeking for forgiveness are an important and necessary first step in the process of racial reconciliation. Whereas an apology for for dehumanization and injustices cannot erase the past, but a mission of the, wrong, of the wrongs committed can speed racial healing and reconciliation and help confront the ghost of the city's past. Now, therefore, it be, be resolved that the City Council of the City of Antioch, one, apologizes to all early Chinese immigrants and their descendants who came to Antioch and were unwelcome. Two, seeks forgiveness for acts of fundamental injustice, terror, cruelty, and brutality. And three, expresses its commitment to rectify the lingering consequences of the misdeeds committed against early Chinese immigrants under, under before, and during the driving out. That was our resolution. Um, 
and a good part of the resolution is in order to proceed forward, we must acknowledge the things we've done in our past. And that was something we as a council wanted to do, acknowledge our wrongdoings and be able to go in a path of peace and working collectively. So again, thank you so much for having me here to represent the city of Antioch. As today's ceremonies have highlighted, the dehumanizing atrocities of racial violence are not simply a thing of the past. We acknowledge the ongoing realities and the impacts of America's racial karma internationally and in the US cities and in US cities across the nation, including here in Antioch. We are honored to have the family of Angelo Quinto and we acknowledge the systemic violence and tragic loss that led to them joining us. Through their ongoing advocacy work, which led to the passage of California police reform law, including Assembly Bill 490, or Angelo's Law in 2021, and the formation of the Angelo Quinto Foundation, they demonstrate how we can work together to heal and create more just and safe futures for our communities in the face of tragedy. The family, represented by Cassandra Quinto Collins, Robert Collins, and Bella Quinto Collins, will now make a flower offering. Sasana Yi will now offer a lighting of incense for her grandmother's memorial tablet at the altar, her grandmother Wang Yik Oi. After that, we will have nine of our Buddhist leaders making offerings here to the, to the altar. Ainda, ainda. 